What I want to do this evening is to build up on the events that have happened since the Prophecy Day 12 months ago. And we'll obviously have to reach further back just to get some linkages with to build up our themes. But there is an awful lot that has happened. And uh, before I get any further, just to say there are some spare copies of milestones here. If you haven't had the current one, just help yourself. And if you want older ones, there's a box there going way back to the 1970s uh, of old milestones. We need the space. Uh, so go and help yourselves and read what was written 20, 30, 40 years ago. Absolutely amazing. So we want to concentrate mainly on Europe and on Britain. Now, there's lots of things I'd love to deal with, the situation, Israel situation in the Middle East, but we just haven't got time. And so much is happening in the development of Europe as Britain prepares to leave uh, the EU. It's a time of great change, and a change which the Bible has told us about. So it's very exciting to see the things that are happening in the light of Bible prophecy. And Britain has a role Uh, We read from Isaiah chapter 23 and we're going to see how Britain has a role as the latter-day Tarshish power to trade with all nations of the world. But eventually that hire is going to be used to the benefit of the return of Lord Jesus Christ. So we know we're in these latter days which will see the Lord Jesus coming back. And God is allowing Britain to build up her merchant power so that when... Christ comes back and defeats Gog upon the mountains of Israel. There is a nation there willing to submit and to use her forces, her might, to bring the Jews back to their land. So exciting times indeed. The nations are likened to a sea, an angry sea. But the point about a sea when it breaks upon the shore... As the tide comes in, it advances and then goes back, advances again and goes back to and fro, to and fro. And Bible prophecy, the fulfilment of Bible prophecy is very much like that. Back in 1917, Balfour Declaration, Jews could go back and have a homeland. It took 30 years before we get to 1948 and the Jews have their homeland. Many reverses, but gradually, step by step, Things move forward and forward. And we're in this interesting stage that just at the moment, there looks as if there have been a lot of setbacks. A lot of things seem to be going backwards. Israel is facing um, increased uh, difficulties in trying to stop Iran from uh, entering into Syria. Now the Russians have put in this advanced uh, defence system Uh, And furthermore, just yesterday I was reading that Iran has been busy in the last few weeks while Israel is pondering what to do about these S-300 missiles. She's been advancing weaponry to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Now Hezbollah, they hide their stuff, very much like Hamas, among the civilian population. And so increasing problems for Israel. How do we deal with this without civilian casualties? And we have the increased threat of Hamas. Every Friday, mass people gather on the border to protest at Israel being there. And so we were looking for a time of peace and blessing for Israel, a time of stability, but we seem to be moving back. But that's only because the tide will turn again, and there will indeed be the time of peace that God has promised. And we seem to have Brexit unravelling, don't we? It's not the smooth, simple process of Britain leaving. It's a very convoluted pathway. And Germany, who is the main driver behind Europe, just at the moment, is faltering. We look at Saudi Arabia in the light of the Khashoggi murder, how the relationship between Britain and America and Saudi Arabia is under threat because of what has happened. And so that's a backward step because we, we see Britain and America to be in the Middle East working with these countries. And the Roman Catholic Church, 
we know there's got to be that man of sin power at the time of the end, the religious power behind the EU. And yet it seems to be unravelling because of all the problems they have with sexual abuse. And at the moment there is this rift between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Greek Orthodox Church over the church in Ukraine. But all these things, brothers and sisters and young people, they're, they're tests of our faith. They will change. The situation will move forward. These are just temporary setbacks upon that pathway. The tide is going back, but it will come forward again. We have to keep faith. God is in control. He's working to his timetable, not our timetable. Now, one of the great signs for our generation is anti-Semitism. Because we know that all nations, that passage from Zechariah chapter 12, talks about all nations coming against Jerusalem. And so we should expect to live in the time of the end in an era that is anti-Semitic against the Jewish people. And that's exactly what we see. Whether it's in the British Labour Party, whether it's in the American Democratic Party, whether it's in the left-wing parties emerging in Europe, there is a spirit against Israel which is beginning to be part of that preparation for the nations to come against Israel. And what is so interesting is also to see another layer upon this, and that is the rift that is growing between Europe and America. Very cleverly um, captured in this uh, front cover of The Economist, that was when Trump was coming, he paid a visit to Britain and then went to the NATO meeting and met the EU leaders. But the cartoonist very cleverly saw this split that was growing between Britain and America. And Britain is being pushed on one side and onto the side of America, uh, rather than going with Europe. But it's a long, slow process, this rift. And uh, there's a, a closer up in case you can't see the detail of it. And it's, uh, Europe is increasingly feeling confident that she can stand on her own feet. On Sunday there are elections, more elections in Germany. Germany is a big country and split into different states. There was uh, a very poor election as far as Merkel was concerned a fortnight ago in uh, Bavaria. And it's now the turn of mess, uh, if that's how you pronounce it, mess um, Their elections, and again it's predicted that she will do very badly, her party will do very badly there. And the party that's coming to the fore are the Greens. And the Greens are saying, we don't need America, we can stand on our own feet. And this is a general feeling, not only in Germany but in Europe. We don't need America. And if one read the uh, European press you would see how many articles they have against America decrying Trump. They don't like being dictated to by America. And in fact, uh, this was uh, in September, the headline was the world upside down as EU and Russia unite against the United States. That's exactly what we've been waiting for, isn't it, brothers and sisters and young people? That's what scripture tells us, that... Uh, Europe and Russia will cooperate together. And America and Britain will be on an opposing side. They're not on the side of the nations that come against Israel. They are opposed to it. And we begin to see this coming to pass. Now, my father wrote about this in the very early milestones. Back in 1978, his preface was, Russia might get mightier, Western Europe's preparedness and will to fight gets less. America and Europe are now more detached. For France and Germany, futility to resist the might of the Soviet. And in 1980, his whole chapter, Western Europe swings away from America towards the Soviet. And the following year, first chapter, Western Europe torn between the US and the USSR. How much further we have come in those uh, 40 years since he wrote those things. We can trust prophecy. It will come to pass. So what does the Bible tell us about the situation in Europe in these last days? 
Because we are in the latter days, there are many passages of scripture that give us quite a detailed picture, so we need have no doubt as to how the final picture is going to be. The most well known are Daniel chapter 2, the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, and Revelation chapter 16. Now very powerful end of time prophecies. Daniel chapter 2, we know about it and how successive empires came and went. And we're in the time of the forming of the feet. Haven't yet been formed, they are being formed before our eyes. And it is upon these iron clay feet that the image is going to stand erect. And from other passages, Joel chapter 3, Ezekiel chapter 38, Zechariah 12, tells us that this image stands on its feet in order to come against Israel, to come against Israel into the mountains of Israel, to be smitten by the little stone power which will smite the feet and the whole edifice will be destroyed. So we're in this final stage, the forming of the feet. Now we can label that with the same message contained in Revelation chapter 16, which talks about a beast and a dragon and a false prophet. And we know the uh, two feet are the beast and the dragon and the head and the eyes and mouth are the false prophet. It's talking about the same thing. At the time of the end, this is the final picture. Uh, Feet described as beasts and dragons. In earlier chapters in Revelation, in earlier times talking about the legs, it talks about a beast of the sea and a beast of the earth and a dragon power. But we're in this latter day stage. This is what is forming. This is what we're seeing happening. The forming of these two feet before our eyes. Now the important thing about these feet is that they're going to carry the image to the land of Israel. In order to defeat the nation of Israel, to drive them out of their land, to take them captive, to slay many of them. In order to have feet like that, they have to have armies to take them to the land of Israel. Now what we have seen in Russia is a very strong, mighty power under Putin. But we don't see yet an army in Europe. And that's what we're going to be looking at. How with the exit of Britain, Europe is working very hard and very fast to build up its army. That army will be used to join forces with Russia, with the other leg, to take it to the land of Israel. And these legs are not in isolation. They are attached to, uh, sorry, the feet are not in isolation. They are attached to legs. And we know what those legs were in the past. In the east we had a czar and a strong church working together. And in the west we had a pope and an emperor working together. That's what the iron tells us about. And that kind of state continues, but with the addition, Daniel chapter 2 tells us, that in the latter days there's a new addition. It's not just iron on its own, as it was in the past. There's iron mixed with clay. And as we read there, the feet of the toes of the feet were part iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. And whereas thou saw iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. They're not compatible. And yet God, two and a half thousand years before, set out the situation that is applicable to today, where clay speaks to us, the seed of men speaks to us of Adam, doesn't he? He was created out of the dust of the earth. It speaks of democracy, people power. And this is something unique to our age. It's only in the past hundred years that people have been able to vote and influence what happens. So, we still expect to see strong power in Europe, working with the church, both in the West and in the East. And as Putin said, Christianity is the foundation of the Russian state. Take Christianity out of it, and the Russian state is nothing. 
And we're waiting to see that kind of application in the Western leg, and it's beginning to come. So if we just go back to the connection between the legs and the feet, the legs came eventually to an end in World War I, with the last Hapsburg monarch, Charles I, uh, resigning. And then voting across Europe, Britain included, came in. And we now have an estate where there is democracy and autocracy mingled together. Not mixing very well at all. But as we come to a prospect at Europe, we shall see increasingly this mixture of the hardness and the authoritarianism um, of the iron uh, mingled with the church, which is also autocratic, but mingled with people power, democracy. Uh, and we find it whether we look at the eastern foot or the western foot. If we look at the eastern leg, again it came to the end, same time, 1918, um, with the Tsar Nicholas II being murdered. And again, democracy was introduced into Russia, and an eastern foot began to be formed still uh, in its infancy, but it is further advanced in the east than it is at the west. Um, We have the rebirth of the Russian church with the fall of communism, uh, and Putin models himself upon Tsar uh, Peter the Great. So we have the the iron, the mixture of the uh, Tsar and the church, and mingle with democracy, because yes, there is voting in Russia, Um, The Duma is uh, voted upon, but we can see the iron is the dominant. The clay uh, hasn't got much strength or power. And what's so fascinating that this breakup of the ending of the legs in preparation for the forming of the feet is also linked with Israel, because it was at the end of World War I that Israel was given that opportunity to return to their land and to establish a homeland which they did in 1948. So we marvel at the power of God being able to foresee these things. So, what we're seeing in the tumult that is taking place in Europe at the moment are nations being sorted out. They have to belong either to the western leg, to the EU, or they have to belong to the eastern leg, the Russian leg. Now, the nations that are being affected are the ones that lie on the division between the historically between the two legs. I don't know what's happened to the shading colour there. It's suddenly changed, but never mind. Um, that was the Western Roman Empire. That was the Eastern Roman Empire. And the division ran up uh, the Balkans. Now, to the north was barbarian country back in Roman times. But if we just project upwards uh, as a a, a possible uh, dividing line that nations on this side will be part of the western leg and the nations on the other side will be part of the eastern leg, we can see how that's uh, panning out at the moment. These are just some of the headlines that show the problem that Russia is causing at the moment to Europe. She's using uh, cyber uh, means to influence the parties in these critical countries and using whatever pressure she can to influence these border nations to turn their allegiance away from the EU, which has got its own problems with the euro, with Germany weak and with Brexit, So she's using these opportunities to uh, promote parties which are favourable to Russia. And she is beginning to draw nations away. Now, she hasn't, apart from Crimea, um, she hasn't succeeded, but she is working upon it. And we can see how in Turkey, she is very cleverly working in Turkey to pull Turkey away from the EU and succeeding. In fact, Turkey is just uh, receiving Defence S-400, the very latest um, uh, anti-ballistic missile system uh, from Russia. 
Much to the chagrin of NATO, because Turkey is a big NATO member, but she is receiving a defence thing which is incompatible with being a NATO member. Uh, And with the events that have been taking place recently, we can see her being drawn uh, that away towards Russia. And uh, Greece too is in a difficult position financially. And again, Russia is waiting in the wings if the euro, uh, if Greece has to give up the euro and be kicked out of the EU, then Putin very much wants to pick up the pieces. And the government there is very pro Russian because they are an orthodox country. And Russia is an orthodox country. Whereas this is Roman Catholic country. So they're a bit of an oddity. They're being drawn uh, towards uh, Russia. Russia is also uh, working on Romania and Bulgaria. They're members of the EU, but they're the poor relations. The dream that they had that being in the EU was going to be all wonderful and solve all their problems hasn't worked out at all. And again, uh, Russia is working politically and uh, cyber-wise to influence those two countries to feel, well, perhaps we might not be, we perhaps we'll be better off back with Russia. So uh, putting discord among them. And also the uh, Serbian leader, again, Russia is spending a lot of money and influence in uh, Serbia to get the Bosnians to turn towards Russia, which was their traditional viewpoint before Europe came along and tried to pull them uh, Europe-wise. Also, as we go up, the countries there, Hungary and the Czech Republic, uh, are being pulled. uh, Russia is working very hard. Latvia too, uh, which was part of the Soviet Uh, Again, Russia is working very hard to uh, influence what is happening there. And uh, um, in the Ukraine, uh, we know with the problems that they've got there, that Russia is still fomenting trouble. Uh, She has taken over the eastern part of Ukraine and is trying to take over more. So we can see this is the trouble spot. These are the trouble spots. And uh, just last week, an uh, interesting article how Russia is back in Libya, uh, pulling her because the, the Libya is divided into two and the person in charge of the eastern section is very much uh, on the Soviet side. So interestingly, just how she is working behind the scenes. And as Don Tuss said, Russia is the main threat to EU unity. The EU can see that Russia is working to move countries across. Now, ultimately, it's not going to matter because the two legs are going to cooperate together against a common foe, as I see it, Israel. But they've got to be formed into two feet, and that's what we see happening. So, let's have a look. We'll look at Brexit in a moment. I want to see how Europe has been working in the past year especially, since we were here a year ago, a lot has happened. So we're in a period of negotiations, in fact we've gone beyond it because they should have been finished last week, uh, negotiations for Brexit, but they have become marred down. But as I say, EU has been very busy. She's got other matters on her mind other than Brexit. She wants to unify, she wants to become a United State of Europe. So, a year ago, Juncker had given his State of the Union speech, which very much was the driving force. We have to unite, we have to work together, we have to forget individual identities as nations, we have to think of ourselves as Europeans. And Macron, the newly appointed French uh, president, he gave a very similar speech, saying we got to think as Europeans not as French and German and Dutch and that. And then, uh, after a year ago, on the 13th of November, the United Nations, the United Nations, the EU, had their first meeting of PESCO. Now, PESCO is something very important. 
If we're cynic, it's the Italian for a peach tree, which is soft on the outside but has a very stony heart. But it actually stands for permanent structured cooperation. The problem with Europe is every country, Britain included, has their own defence forces, their own army, their own air force, their own tanks, their own everything. And there isn't the interoperability that uh, America has, because America, many states, but one defence force. And what Europe is saying, we've got to be one. We've got to unify things. And this chart uh, says it all. The population of the EU, it's much bigger, because this includes um, Britain at the moment. Uh, it's 56% bigger than the United States. And yet its spending is uh, less than half of what the American spends on the military. And it's this last part here, the number of weapons systems, 178 if we count up all the different systems in uh, the EU, whereas America has 38, 30, sorry. Uh, main battle tanks, 17, a British one, a German one, a French one, 17 different tanks. America just has one. Now think of the manufacturing savings if you're manufacturing just one tank rather than 17 different ones. 29 destroyers of frigates, America, uh, much smaller, but has only four. And fighter planes, instead of 20, just six. So what they're planning to do, this is what PESCO is all about, that we give up our individual defence systems we pull everything together. We work to one common standard. And so this meeting which they held was hailed as something very historic. 23 Europeans, uh, another two have now joined up, uh, 23 European Union member nations took a major step towards forming a European army on November the 13th. Meeting in Brussels, the nations agreed to coordinate their defence spending and planning in order to boost the fighting effectiveness of the EU as a whole, rather than designing their militaries only to defend their individual borders. A historic moment, a milestone. And it was a remarkable step. Um, so that's the, the first PESCO meeting. And then the beginning of this year, in January, was the Munich uh, Security Council. This is something that's held in Germany every year where the defence people around the world get together uh, and talk about security issues. And what the EU were saying we have made a major change. We're looking as a collective whole a European army. That's what they were trumpeting. And then uh, a month later was the 55th anniversary of the, Ang uh, the French-German treaty uh, and Merkel and Macron got together and said, we've got to push this. This needs speed and urgency. And then at the, uh, the first actual meeting, that was where they agreed to set up their first meeting, was on the 6th of March. And then in uh, June they set a budget... At the moment, defence is left to each country. So Britain has a defence budget, France has a defence budget. But now for the first time in the future EU budget, which runs from 2021 to 2027, they're planning to budget £13 billion, uh, as a common pool in the budget for defence. Uh, on the 1st of July, the... Austrian um, Chancellor uh, Kurt became the uh, European Council President. Every six months there is a new president. This is something that's been going on for about 20 years and it was his turn and we'll see the significance of that in a moment. And then uh, in July, again, they wanted money more urgently than a budget uh, way back in 2021. And so there was half a billion uh, euros funded uh, for immediate cooperation matters. And then in September, Juncker gave his next, his last State of the Union speech. And again, we will look at that, a very significant one. 
He's retiring in May, so this was a very important speech as far as he was concerned. So, if we just go back to this uh, first meeting when they actually, uh, having said last year we're going to do it, they met. Um, and it's interesting. Brexit has indeed been an accelerator. The European Defence Fund, prepared in only five months since Juncker's State of the Union speech, is of unprecedented scale, both in terms of financial means committed and the parameter of activities envisaged. So they recognise we're moving at speed. That's what Juncker said. The wind's in our sails. Let's push on with this creating a reunited Europe. And so they set up this fund, and the purpose of this 13 billion defence fund was that they should be able to defend themselves. The European Union needs to take greater responsibility for defending and protecting its citizens, their values and way of life. We can't depend on America. We can't depend on NATO. We've got to do it ourselves. Now, very interestingly, with this 13 billion uh, defence fund, Britain and America have been excluded. Yet, until now, Britain has been one of the major um, powers for as far as military, new military matters are concerned. But this has been specifically set up to shut Britain and America out. Uh, To qualify for the funding, companies will have to be based in the European Union, have their infrastructure in the European Union, and above all, decision-making cannot be controlled by an entity based outside the European Union. So, much to Mrs May's chagrin, um, Britain has been told you won't be able to take part uh, in any of the projects And Britain has put a lot of money into the Galileo project, which is to build a rival GPS system to rival the Americans. They don't want to be dependent upon uh, the Americans for their sat-navs working. So Europe has spent a lot of money and Britain has been foremost in the development of those satellites and technology needed so that Europe can be independent of America. So Mrs May has said, well... Britain will have to go it alone. Jumped a mocked her and said, you can't do that, you need a big country like the EU to be able to do that. But of course Israel is able to have her own satellites. We shall see what happens. So let's say there was a change in uh, every six months in the uh, European Union Council President and Kurtz was elected last year as Chancellor of uh, Austria, and he had this to say when he won the elections, that Austria is a country that can function in Europe as a bridgehead between Eastern and Western Europe. Uh, It's always been good for our economy and politically, I believe that to be our obligation. So, eastward extends to Russia, westward to the EU. Austria sees itself as in the middle to bring both sides together. And his slogan for his presidency is a Europe that protects. Now, he's a very strong Roman Catholic, and he sees a a role for the church in defending Europe against the Muslim invasion. In fact, his coalition partners are very anti-migrants. So he very much wants to see a strong Europe with strong Catholic roots to be the bulwark against an invasion. Well, to celebrate his presidency, he has set up in the headquarters of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, uh, Brussels, sorry, in the Justice Lipsius uh, building, which is their headquarters, an uh, exhibition, museum, and a play on the EU museum, museum in a nutshell, and featuring a crown. And this is showing the, uh, some of the treasures which are held in Vienna. Um, part of them is the crown of the Holy Roman Empire. This is the crown that Hitler took from Austria and took to Nuremberg because he saw that as a symbol of the Third Reich that he was setting up. So it's very much a symbol of ancient Europe 
combined as a your emperor and uh, pope working together. So what he said, so well, what um, Otto Habsburg, the son of the last emperor, said, we in Austria possess a European symbol which belongs to all nations of Europe equally. This is the crown of the Holy Roman Empire, which embodies the tradition of Charlemagne. Now, Charlemagne was the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. First of all, he was king of the Franks, then king of the Lombards, and finally in 800 he was crowned by the Pope as the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, it's interesting, the techniques that he used, he is very popular in the EU because he loved having laws. Every way of life was regulated by rules and regulations. Exactly like the EU, they, they model themselves upon Charlemagne. And Charlemagne insisted that all his uh, subjects uh, should be Roman Catholic. Now, we know the problems that the Protestants had. Our brothers and sisters of past ages, they had to flee. But at a time of great um, bloodshed. So he spent 30 years forcefully converting Saxony to his crown and Catholicism. The sanguinary methods used were unknown to earlier Middle Ages. He used brute force. Uh, Maybe we shall see a bit more of that. Persecution if you don't believe what the church teaches. Could well spread to this country as well. But let's just have a look at uh, Juncter's uh, last speech back in September. And again, the theme was the hour of European sovereignty. Now, sovereignty is a self-governing state. He's saying, we're a united Europe. That's where we're driving to, and the hour has come for this. The world has not stopped turning, he said. It's more volatile than ever. The external challenges facing our continent are multiplying by the day. There can, therefore, be not a moment's respite in our efforts to build a more united Europe. The world today needs a strong, united Europe. I will continue to work day and night over the next months to see the European Defence Funds and PESCO become fully operational. By next year, we should also address the international role of the euro. The euro is 20 years young and has already come a long way, despite its critics. That is why, before the end of the year, the Commission will present initiatives to strengthen the international role of the euro. The euro must become the face and the instrument of a new, more sovereign Europe. And he added, we must improve our ability to speak with one voice when it comes to our foreign policy. Now, that's just a little tiny extract from about an hour-long speech. But full of pressure. We've got to move on. Time is not on our side. We've got to stand on our own feet. We've got to unify. And um, Brexit is that great opportunity because Britain was the one that stood in the way of them unifying. So with that gone. And they want to make the euro uh, uh, an international currency. As he quite rightly said, we only get 5% of our fuel from America, but all fuel we have to pay for in dollars. And again, with the military, nearly all military stuff is sold in American dollars. And he said, why? Let's use the euro. Let's buy our uh, oil and our defence things in euros. And then they don't have all the problems of depending on the exchange rate between the dollar and the euro. So that's what they're driving for. Uh, And then, you know, with that, they will have a United States of Europe. They've got their uh, territory, they've got their free borders, they've got their currency, and now they're building their own army. All the trappings of a state. And that's what scripture tells us. It stands on its own feet. There is a beast system like there was in the past, reflecting what happened in the past, but with this added layer of democracy. As I say, last uh, fortnight ago, 14th October, uh, was the Bavarian elections um, and the CSU, which is associated and joins in with Merkel's uh, party. They had a disastrous uh, showing in the uh, elections. They lost a lot of seats, 
which means that Merkel uh, will have fewer seats. Now remember, it took her six months last year to form a government. The, their stock exchange, the Drax, is down 12% this year. Britain's is down 6%, French is down 3%. But the powerhouse of Europe is, is stuttering. The car manufacturing, the chemical firms, the banks in Germany are in crisis. And the new revolution is not the manufacturing revolution that Germany has built its base upon, but it's technology. And there's very little technological firms in Germany. It seems to have passed them by. Britain is that centre for technology. So, difficult uh, times for Mr Merkel. And as I say, she's likely to lose even more seats with the elections this coming Sunday. So we can only speculate. Uh, there seems a lot of people that talk about her falling. Um, and who will take his place? Well, we can only speculate. But waiting in the wings is this youngish man, uh, Theodore um, Gottenberg. Uh, he was the old defence minister, but he had to resign because of uh, his plagiarism in his uh, university treaties. But he's in America. But he is very popular, and he came back last year to support Mr. Merkel in uh, elections. And he will transform Germany. If a man like this, who has these aristocratic roots, um, as you can see... Um, feel very sorry for his wife when they got married and the registrar having to go through all those names. Um, but, you know, we don't know. We don't know. But there is a man who is very popular in Germany. People will rally behind him. And he will very much support because uh, Germany and Austria, both of them would like to have an emperor just as a figurehead, but you know, uh, he would support such a move um, in Europe. So what is interesting is how these three parties cooperate. So the beast and the dragon do cooperate together, uh, France and Germany especially. Um, we've seen quite a lot of dialogue between Putin and the papacy, and the papacy is working very hard to get its influence in the EU. So we just tease out uh, a few of those things. There is uh, an organisation, the Catholic Church in the European Union, who, along with the Jesuit European Social Centre, uh, has a two-monthly newsletter, Euro Infos. Um, you might not be able to read this, but uh, Catholics Engaging in Politics, this was in the last one. Italian Catholics were recently invited by Pope Francis to be more engaged in politics. Rome is certainly working. We don't see it in this country, but on the continent there is a very strong, powerful movement uh, to accept the authority of the church as being something that can bind Europe together. See, at the moment, Europe wants to become one entity, uh, and yet it's got all these nationalistic uh, entities. So the common thing that binds them is religion. And as the Protestants have more or less gone back to the mother, um, then Roman Catholicism uh, is the common thing that will bind them together. And the Pope, of course, very much is behind, the Roman system has been very much behind the forming of the EU and what it stands for. And the Pope said a couple of years ago that unless they become a United States of Europe, they will be nothing in the world. He very much uh, approves this coming together. And Article 17 of the Lisbon Treaty uh, makes the politicians have to consult with the churches, and they do that quite happily. Um, it's not an onus thing with them. And even with this rotating presidency every six months, uh, for the past 20 years, every six months, uh, representatives of the churches of Europe meet with the new uh, EU president in order to tell them what they want. And how interesting uh, there were two or three subjects, but the main one was uh, Brexit. 
They emphasised the need of efforts to prevent a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, a visible frontier, church representatives said, that jeopardises the common achievements of reconciliation and peace and divides citizens on both sides must be avoided. So they were saying, what we as churches want you to do, make sure there isn't a hard border between North and South Ireland. We'll come to that in a moment. And uh, Donald Tusk, who is the European Council President, uh, he delivered a speech earlier this month, the role of the Catholic Church in the process of European integration. Now that's Conference 18. For the past 18 years, every year, there has been uh, a conference, uh, the role of the Catholic Church in the process of European integration. So in Europe, they see it. We don't see it. This isn't reported uh, uh, in Britain. But uh, very much, much pressure to bring the church into focus. And we know what a dominant role it has to play. Now, one of the ways that Europe uh, is cooperating with Russia, or at least Germany is cooperating with Russia, is this gas pipeline which takes gas from Russia straight into Germany and makes Germany a very important hub for the distribution of Russian gas. Now, in 2011-2012, the first twin pipeline was laid down, and now they are building a second twin pipeline, two more pipelines, much to Mr Trump's displeasure because he sees this as Europe becoming dependent upon Russia and that's what he wants to break. But uh, this is going ahead. They have got wonderful problem that Denmark possesses uh, an isolated island there and hasn't yet given permission for the new pipe to follow the path of the old pipe. But uh, Russia and Germany aren't terribly worried because all they'll do, they just go round and uh, circumnavigate it. But already they are building this pipeline. September the 5th they were starting that end, October the 6th starting this end. So they'll soon get to that middle bit. Uh, where they'll put it, we don't know. But it's intended to be finished, the pipeline, 2019, ready for pumping gas 2020. So Germany will be very dependent, over 55% of the gas will then come from Russia. Now you might wonder why I put a slide in of this chap's murder. But this might be one of those pivotal happenings which changes the course uh, of history. South, uh, Saudi Arabian journalist, but with Turkish ancestry. He was a high school friend of Bin Laden and has had many talks with, had many talks with Bin Laden in the past. He was a big supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood, which wants to drive Israel out and replace Israel with an Islamic State. And the Muslim Brotherhood is now banned in Saudi Arabia and banned in Egypt. But the Muslim Brotherhood is supported by Turkey and Little Qatar. Now he was brutally murdered while he was visiting the embassy to get papers for him to marry for the fourth time. Um, and you know, the details are now coming out. But what is interesting is how... Oops, sorry. Yep, going the wrong way. Uh, is how uh, Ergodan is using this incident to bolster his standing. Because of what Turkey is doing moving towards Russia, she's out of favour with the EU and out of favour with uh, America. But America wants to, and Britain does, wants to still continue to trade with Saudi Arabia. So he is trying to find a way of whitewashing what has happened in order to please America and then be in the favour of America and Britain. At the same time, he doesn't like Saudi Arabia. A lot of antagonism between Saudi Arabia and Turkey. Saudi Arabia supports the Kurds in Syria. Uh, the Turkish Prime Minister wants to eliminate the Kurds. 
So again, if he can help the uh, Saudi Arabians get out of the hole that they have dug themselves in, then they will be obligated to him. And maybe one of the prices they have to pay is to let the Kurds go. We don't know. We just have to wait and see. But this can be one of those incidents that can turn the course of history. So, Brexit itself. Um, so, yes, you've seen these because I was pressing the wrong way. But a uh, wonderful subject for the cartoonist as Mrs May struggles against the iron of the EU. It is implacable, unmovable, uh, hostile to Britain because it doesn't want anybody to leave because that is a slap in the face for their great plans of unifying. On the other hand, they'd be glad to see Britain go because she's a thorn in their flesh, but they don't want other nations to follow Britain's steps, so they're making it as hard as they possibly can. If you know... Uh, I've forgotten his name, the artist. Banksy. Banksy. If you know Banksy, uh, you'll understand that cartoon. If you don't know what happened, you won't understand it. Uh, yesterday's, uh, um, again, you've got to know what the background is, but I thought, well, that, that was a good one. Uh, I'll pop that on. That's yesterday's uh, cartoon in the Torah. Yeah, the EU is uh, making life very difficult for Mrs. Mann. She is a Remainer at heart, um, but she undertook to leave Brexit. But she would love to have one foot in the EU. And the angels have been so busy trying to instruct Britain that they've got to have no feet in Europe. They've got to have a clean break. Uh, and step by step, this is being forced upon Britain. So, the interesting thing is that what is the main stumbling block is a religious matter. This border between Northern and Southern Ireland is all to do with religion, not politics. Uh, at the moment, there are many roads crossing between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. The only difference is the quality of the roads. Uh, you can see which side is Northern Ireland with lots of money spent and which is uh, Southern Ireland. But, you know, many crossing points, and because both are in the EU, you know, traffic freely goes across. But, because uh, Britain is the pound and Southern Ireland is the uh, euro, there have to be uh, uh, checks on what goes on. But it's done remotely with surveillance cameras and uh, the system works quite well. Now, when we consider Northern Ireland uh, and the division, we can see it is a religious matter. Uh, the Protestants amount to 41.6% and the Roman Catholic 408 So you can see it's quite finely balanced. The Protestants in Northern Ireland consider themselves as unionists, union with the United Kingdom, whereas the Catholics in Northern Ireland consider themselves as Irish. And so there is always this, this contest within Northern Ireland. Uh, Ireland would love to absorb Northern Ireland back in its embrace. Uh, and Britain is on the side of the Protestants uh, to keep it part of the Union. And so the DUP party, which is the party that's helping Mrs May keep in power, very much the Protestant party doesn't want anything to do with being absorbed. This is what they fear. That what the EU is planning by stealth is to take over the Northern Ireland under the guise of, well, we can't have a hard border so you'll have to be, remain part of the EU. In that case you're going to be broken off from Britain. And the DUP don't want that and nobody wants that. But, you know, it is so interesting that uh, it uh, is a matter of religion. Now, the problems can be solved if there's goodwill on both sides. And it's, uh, Britain has put forward perfectly good ideas of how to deal with trade once Northern Ireland is no longer in the EU, but Ireland itself is. But it depends on the goodwill of the EU. Um, we just have to wait and see what happens. But as I say, it does seem that the angels are taking things right to the wire. Uh, and God is making sure that when Britain does leave, 
It won't be to the glory of any leader in Britain. It will be because it is God's plan and purpose. Uh, And then thereafter, presumably, a strong leader will arise and will take Britain on that course uh, of uh, being a worldwide trader. But at the moment, she's being humbled um, because she hasn't got enough trust to let go of the EU, a Roman Catholic Europe. So what did the Bible tell us in the time has gone on to it? But the Bible, uh, Britain, the Middle East, let's do it in a nutshell. A number of passages, uh, some of them are listed there, speak to us that there is a latter-day Tarshish power, Tyre or Tarshish. Um, But the most well-known probably is in Ezekiel chapter 38, which speaks of Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, all the young lions at a time when Israel is invaded. So our days... And uh, the reading that we had of Isaiah 23 tells us that there is to be a latter-day Tarshish power which uses her wealth to help the Lord Jesus when he comes back. And the interesting thing about Isaiah 23 is it tells us about the process that her own feet shall carry her afar off to Sodom. When Alexander the Great came and conquered uh, Tyre, then the power of Tyre moved. Now, it moved, first of all, down to Alexandria, built by Alexander the Great, uh, and named after himself. And Alexandria became the centre, and in New Testament times we read of ships of Alexandria. Uh, Don't take the dates up there as uh, exact, because... All these things, there was a build-up and there was a, a slow-down and an overlapping, but it just gives you rough ideas of the dates up there. And that, that lasted uh, for about a thousand years. Um, and then it moved, the mercantile power moved to Venice, and Venice became the centre for about 500 years. Then Venice began to have problems and Genoa on the other side of Italy took up the... Uh, cudgel, as it were, of having a mercantile power for about 100 years, and that was then challenged by the Portuguese, uh, the Portuguese explorers going out, and Lisbon became the most important centre. And then that, in turn, was challenged by the Dutch, the Dutch uh, West Indies, East Indies, sorry, um, and Amsterdam became the dominant power. And then, in parallel, you know, Britain began to exert herself and for the past three, four hundred years has been the dominant merchant power in the spirit of Tyre. Her own feet shall carry her afar off to sojourn. And here we are, Isaiah tells us, in these last days, when Tyre, and obviously this would have an application in the time of Babylon and Alexander, but Clearly it has a latter-day application of a 70-year downtreading for Tyre before it's visited by God at the end of 70 years and then goes back to trading with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. But that strength and that power is built up in order for it to be used to the service of God. And that's what we see. Britain is the only country that fits all the clues that scripture tells us about the latter day Tarshish it is to the west of Israel remember that uh, Jonah went to Joppa to catch a ship to Tarshish uh, early Britons were descended from Javan and Tarshish with Javan's son ancient source of silver, iron, tin and lead that Ezekiel 27 tells us about and she is a naval power in the spirit of Tyre And for Ezekiel 38, she's the only country that has a commonwealth, independent young lions. And Britain is a leading merchant power, um, and that is growing. And two-thirds of the world's cargo is uh, handled by Britain. And what is interesting um, is... No, go back. Uh, What is interesting is that... uh, the whole concept of Brexit is to be a trading power and Britain is building up her merchant uh, forces. The new uh, 
aircraft carrier was visiting New York earlier um, this week and uh, business people were coming and doing business deals on it. Britain is determined to rule the waves. She needs ships if she's going to be a merchant power. So it is very interesting. She also hasn't suffered through Brexit, uh, all the doom things. She is now the unicorn capital of Europe and a unicorn is a technology company worth at least a billion dollars. And Britain has virtually uh, the same number as France and Germany and the Netherlands all added together. So she is in a very strong position. Technology is the biggest thing. Um, And Britain, uh, the the leaders in Britain, Liam Fox has been travelling around the world the last two years promoting British trade. Um, fascinating. Just uh, last week there was a 16-page supplement in the Times magazine, Maritime Economy, and uh, just one of the articles was from the UK Admiralty that uh, estimated that £47 billion is added to the British economy through what she does with the sea in all sorts of aspects. 95% of the UK's uh, trade is gathered by the sea, uh, and a growth market uh, expected to double uh, in the next 15 years. So we see Britain uh, situated in the area of Sheba and Dedan. She has a base in Dedan in Bahrain. She has uh, a base to the south in Qatar. She has a base in Oman, um, and she has also bases off the map in uh, the Indian Ocean and up in Cyprus and down in Africa. She's very much involved in this area because this is where trade has to pass through the Suez Canal. So she's very keen to be in this area. So but it is wonderful how she is being drawn back there. When I was a youngster, you know, Britain withdrew from this area and we thought, well, she can't possibly go back. Just wait, and she has. And the other great thing is how Britain is working with Israel. Uh, exports have been booming this year, compared with last year, um, way, way up. Um, a big, uh, important uh, country. And in the trade agreements that Britain is wanting to make, she's targeted ten countries, one of which is Israel, to make a trade, a free trade agreement. So, um, in spite of Israel's small economic size in global terms, uh, she's got so much that she can give to the British economy in the field of innovation and technology. So, brothers and sisters, uh, that's my last one slide. Um, In so many ways, we should be encouraged. Remember the tide goes to and fro. There will be setbacks. It will test our faith. But eventually, just wait long enough, God's purpose will work out. And it's truly remarkable that our God can see way into the future and can cause the prophets to record centuries, millennia ago, the details that we see coming to pass with our eyes. Our Lord is at the door. We must watch and wait. Everything will drop into place. God's word is true from the beginning. So it is difficult to keep up to date. I find it a great problem to keep up to date. But these snippets, if you've not signed up to them, this is the kind of a a newspaper of all the uh, items that I think are interesting that are used for the milestones and for the Bible magazine updates. Um, And it it helps to keep an eye eye on what is happening in other parts of the world, which don't get reported in our papers, and BBC certainly doesn't uh, touch but just send me an email, I'll put you on the list. So, remind you, if you want a, a milestones, and um, there is a box there, a blue box there, full of old milestones. Please help yourself. Thank you.